CDA exam prep part three. About the CDA exam. All right, so here are some things about the CDA exam. The CDA exam covers early childhood best practices that are found in your CDA textbook standards and functional areas. Use your 120 hours of professional and 480 hours of classroom experience in this exam prep guide to help you answer the questions appropriately. How many questions? So during the CDA exam, it is usually 65 multiple choice questions, including five of those questions that have a photo and brief classroom scenarios. Since they list slash rules. You will need to bring a valid photo ID with your signature. You will have to sign in a test agreement and agree with those rules. Before entering the test room, the protractor will ask you to leave all of your personal belongings in the car or in a locker. I said protractor is proctor. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, no one can wait for you in the waiting room, so if you have your children or things like that, I'm sorry you'll have to leave them at the house or find a babysitter for somebody to watch them. And also, if you have to use the restroom while the test is still going on, the timer will still continue. So there's no pause button. If you guys have taken any type of state exam, it's the same thing. Um, always raise your hand if you need assistance. Now, they're not going to tell you the answers, but if you need like a pencil or a piece of paper, you have to raise your hand. All right, so let's go ahead and answer some questions. Question number one. During free playtime, a few of your students created a lot of wonderful artwork. You should A, send it home every day. B, display it in your classroom at the children's eye level. C, have a bulletin board in the hallway for art. D, throw away anything that is not claimed or looks like scribble. B, display it in your classroom at the children's eye level. So I gave you guys a teacher tip, tip at the bottom. Anytime your students are or have created their artwork or any type of classroom work, it is important for you to either write their names down on the bottom or let them write it. So they can write their name. Let's just say on the corner I have Eddie G and you'll ask him, what did you, like what is this? What did you make? What did you draw? So they'll they'll tell you. So this student said Rocket World. So I wrote Rocket World in the bottom. Even though even though this is an example and I didn't write it with my hand, but you're going to write it in that format. And then you're going to put the date on the bottom. So that is a little teacher tip that you guys can implement inside your classrooms, especially if you're just new to this field. But always write their names, their last name, or you can do the last initial and what did they make and the date. But um, you want to keep their um, their artwork at their eye level. So depending on the age group that you're currently working with, what Whatever is the average age height for that your, for your classroom, you're going to level their artwork so they can see it, okay? So if you're dealing with babies, you probably need to have it a little bit lower so they can look at it and probably reach it. Now, they will try to tear it off. Um, it's just, <laughs> it just comes with that age group. So they're going to try to take it off, pull it off, or even brag. Um, if they would like to take it home, you can go ahead and take it home if they are requesting it. But we do want to have their beautiful artwork displayed in our classroom. Question two. Outlet covers should be used. All right. A, in the toddler room, but are not required in the preschool room b in all of your centers because children spend a lot of time there c in all outlets in your classroom including the preschool and school age classrooms d in all outlets in your classroom lower than four feet off of the ground All right, so the answer to that question is C. In all outlets in your classroom, including the preschool and school age classrooms. Now, you're probably saying, oh, 
of course, you're going to have the covers inside. But most teachers that are coming inside of this field, they really don't know that because at home they have the outlets you know, pretty much open and it's available for anybody to get into it. So all outlets must be covered. There's no exceptions to this rule when it comes to safety. Children are very curious and they will explore anything, which includes exposed outlets. So they can get into these outlets by using a pencil, a marker, a colored pencil, scissors, depending on the age, or even the anti-cut scissors that the toddlers use. They will try to stick it in there and probably think that it is a car trying to crank it up. I was one of those kids. So, yes. Yeah, so, make sure it has a outlet cover. If you do not have any outlet covers in your classroom, please request um, that your director or owner to purchase some. But you can buy these outlets at Dollar Tree. So, very cheap. Question three. Your organization environment and practices should reflect CDA company standards. Which of the following procedures is the best indicator of maintaining a commitment to professionalism? A, the variety of learning styles exhibited by students are valued and respected. B, opportunities for intellectual and physical growth are included in the program. C, a weekly bulletin board, which includes upcoming activities and parenting tips and child development information and community sources is compiled and, and distributed. D, a strict policies of con confidentiality is maintained. All right, so the answer to that question is D, a strict policy of con confidentiality is maintained. So if you guys have, you um, but if you guys have your CDA textbook, um, for this section, it does recommend you to keep everything confidentially co confidential. Um, it doesn't matter if the child if it's that child's parent or grandparent certain things should not be be disclosed to anyone um another example of conf confidentiality let's just say if johnny got bit um on his back and the parent the parent of the victim is asking who did this to my child you cannot expose that information to that said parent of the victim so you will say something he just got bitten by a student or a friend just keep it moving um so yeah so that's another example even if they were in the wrong we cannot expose that their information or identify their identity to anyone so that is, that is an example of that um even even though um paperwork you know, like allergies and things like that, that's also included. But I just want to give that as an example for people who do not know that that is against the rules. So do not do that. Um, but yes, always maintain professionalism and com confidentiality, um, even whether it is between staff members, um, parents, other, well, I'll say parents probably not included but i will say other families like grandparents on uh, certain things you should not share with those parents with those um family members no matter how close they are they must be a legal guardian um so yeah so that is an example of that and i just wanted to input that inside of this section question four which of the below are a good way to help parents stay informed with what's going on in your classroom? A, weekly newsletter, newsletters and an informational bulletin board outside of your room. B, written notes will be placed in each student's cubby. C, parent, message parents on the center's communication app, such as Brightwell, ProCare, etc. D, all of above. D, all of above. So no matter what format, what kind of way that you guys are trying to communicate with the parent, just make sure it is consistent. Um, but I personally do prefer 
uses some type of parent teacher communication app such as Bright Wheel, Pro Care, Hi Mama. It's the list that goes on. Um, I do prefer that because they can get notifications right on their phone, right then and there. And it's also a good way to reduce paper. And it's all in one app. Like they can really just scroll. What time Johnny was changed? He was changed at two on one. Um, he had a bathroom accident at one o two. Um, he fell down and scraped his knee at 10 o'clock on the playground. So things like that. I do prefer the app version. That's my favorite, but any one of those will still work. I'll say do all of them, <laughs> but except for the written note, unless it's like a incident report or something like that. Question five, Miss Callie prides herself on educational activities she provides for the children in her home child care practice. She has two four-year-old children in her care. The others are two or three years old. Miss Callie sets out some building blocks. She lets the children have free play with the blocks for several minutes, then adds a challenge for the four-year-olds. Which of the following would be the most appropriate challenge for these children? A, stacking a one block on top of another. B, asking them how many blocks they will need to make a triangle, square, or rectangle. C, asking them to make a shape with the blocks and tell her about it. D, asked them to build something, then recreated one paper. All right, so the answer to that is C, asked them to make a shape with the blocks and tell her about it. So um, as you can see by looking back in the question, it does say uh, for the four-year-olds. So keyword, four-year-olds. So at this stage for four-year-olds, children are still learning about shapes and numbers, but really they have a good form um, foundation of what how to stack blocks. Usually stacking blocks on top of even um, top of each other is mainly a toddler type of level, like the toddlers that are like 12 or 13, 14 months, that's what I would recommend um, for that. That would be appropriate. But for four-year-olds, four they pretty much know how to stack up blocks. Um, so teachers should challenge um, children, especially four-year-olds, to create shapes and let the children tell them about it. Um, for example, what's the difference between a rectangle and a square? The children, the, the four-year-old child, can pretty much tell you what's the difference. They will probably say, well, the rectangle is long or is stretched out. So that's an example of having an open-ended conversation with a four-year-old. Um, so you want to have, um, you want to have conversations that you can understand of the concepts of closed shapes, um, such as polygons, sides, and angles. Um, so yes, I'll say for four-year-old children, they can be challenged by, you know, explaining the difference um, of shapes and also creating them and drawing them. Ashley, a three-year-old in your classroom has seemed very tired lately and has actually fallen asleep during your circle time. You let her sleep for this one time, but as the week continues, this has been happening a few times in a week. What should you do? A, let her sleep. Clearly, her parents are not putting her to bed early enough. B, wake her up. She is missing important learning time. C, let her sleep today. It is clear that she needs it. Talk to her mother at pickup and tell her what are you seeing. Find out from her mom if there have been any recent changes that may be causing this excessive tiredness. D, let her sleep, but tell her mother that she can no longer come to school if she cannot stay awake. Clearly, she just isn't ready to be in school all day. Clearly, she just isn't ready to be in school all day. Clearly, she just isn't ready to be in school all day. Clearly, she just isn't ready to be in school all day. 
All right, so the answer to this question is six. Let her sleep today. It's clear that she needs it. Talk to her mother at pickup and tell her what are you, what are you seeing and find out from Ma if there have been any recent changes that may be causing this excessive sleepiness, um, tiredness. Um, now, depending on your state and your state regulations, this question may vary. Um, I know for from some states, I've heard that, you know, they won't let the students sleep all day. And especially with um, teachers, normally it's one teacher in one classroom. If we're doing another activity, we still have to pay attention to the student that is sleeping, um, whether it's going outside, lunch, or things like that. We just can't completely neglect them. So that can be considered neglect. So... I will recommend letting her sleep for a little bit, but wake her up. But you do not want to disturb them because one, you don't know what is going on inside of their household. You don't know if they move. Like who knows what these what these children are dealing with when they're not in our care. Um, but yes, I will recommend for you to be gentle with your approach if you're talking to the parents about it. Um, some of them may get offended when you're asking them or bringing this up. Most of the time, they will probably lie. Like, you will never know what is going on in their household. But I will let the director know. Let the director know. And whatever the director says, just go based off that. And also look at your state regulations, what they say about it. But normally, they will say let the child sleep. But if you're just one teacher and you, you're doing... We we do a lot inside of the classroom, so I would say let them sleep, um, you know, until the time. But if you're doing circle time, just let her sleep. Then if you're doing something else, give her about thirty minutes to let her sleep it in, and probably try to wake her up. But if she does not get up, call the director, and the director will resolve that. So that's my best bet as a teacher thing, but. Check their fever if, if they are sleeping. They may have a fever or a stomach bug or something that's hurting them. So while you're waking them up, ask them, are you okay? Are you sick? Are you feeling good? Usually, depending on the age group, they will tell you or them point to what it is if they're like a toddler. Um, so explain it to them. Then also, if they're not responding, call the director, let the director know, and she'll make, or he will make their best judgment of what to do with that. So always take their temperature, call the director, what the director say, go on about your business. <laughs> so that's an example of what you guys can use to resolve that information because you never know what is going on with the child. They can just be a um, I'm tired or they just woke up at 2 a.m. and they stayed up and now it is 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock and they're asleep. Company Statement 6. Of the CDA certification standard states that educators are required to maintain a commitment to professionalism. This reflects functional area 13 professionalism. When writing this statement, you will include in your professional portfolio include eight examples and indicators which are provided in your company standards book, B, several examples of what happens in your particular program, C, a paragraph explaining your general understanding of professionalism, D, examples of standards for a good program organization in any program. Now, here you will explain um, your professional beliefs and values about early early childhood education. So, you're going to put in examples and standards that how you actually, I don't know how to explain it, but how you actually exhibit that inside of your classroom, whether it is supporting the needs of your students, um, positive communication so whatever you do inside your classroom you're going to brag about in this 500 word paragraph so you're going to be very detailed of how you do it um i do offer a um a class or a number of series of products that i use for this i do have a cda portfolio course that i go more in depth with this and i also give you guys samples of each of one of these competency standards and functioning areas so make sure you guys look into that um as of right now it it is about $45 or you can get the let 
let's get the CDA portfolio today bundle. That's about $70, $80, depending on the time that you guys are looking at this video. And I also have the CDA portfolio template. Now, the template does not come with a pre fill or pre type um, paragraphs. So you have to do everything on your own. But with the CDA portfolio course, I also give you guys the CD portfolio template within it. So the template is just the template. It doesn't have the webinar access as the course does. But yes, I do go in depth of what to say. I do have an example of, of mine. So basically, you're just going to reflect of why you became an early childhood professional. Um, you're going to talk about the important indicators of prof professionalism that you per possess inside your classroom. I don't know what you guys persist um um, possess in your classroom. So that's one of the things that you're going to brag about how you how you communicate, how you support the needs of your students, all of that. So you're going to go in depth with this paragraph. It, you have to write at least 500 words. So yeah, so that is what you do for the commitment of professionalism. And you can also add, like we just talked about con confidentiality brag on that as well give an example you want it to be very meaty and juicy question eight the teacher is using signs and props to indicate the number of preschoolers allowed in a certain area at one time this is an example of what major effective learning environment element a safety b culture c zoning d setup All right, the question, the answer to this question is a safety. There are four major elements that teachers will use to create an effective learning environment for preschoolers. Um, the element is safety. That is our most important job, important duty, important responsibility for the needs of each child that enters our facility, whether it whether that child is inside of our classroom or next door. We have to make sure that they are safe at all times. That's what parents are paying the center for. That's what they are trusting us to do at all times. Okay. Um, this is associated with the well-being of the preschoolers or no matter what age group they are. Um, so yeah, so your res responsibility as a teacher is to make sure they're safe. Now, safety can be more than just make sure the doors are locked or there's no wet spots on the floor. This can go with how many students are allowed inside of the centers and also have to play with certain toys and things like that. Make sure they're not throwing the wooden blocks. So safety goes very long of what the norm is. But yes, so many times with our centers, there is a certain number that each there's a certain space that it limits for example if you have a small let's just say blocks area you don't want you don't want 10 kids at the blocks area when it can only allow for at least four students to be in that area depending on the size of the carpet the size of the space that's inside of your classroom so if you can tell for when there's four students that's over there it's a lot calmer they have space there's nine jimmy and bob coming along which is making that space to six and now they're knocking over the other students toys they're arguing so you will cut the limit from six to four so all that goes by uh, what you see and how those students act react and being around each other so that's an example of preventing any other injuries let's just say a student trip and fall over a block and bam they got a knot on their head so safety goes beyond make sure the doors a lot making sure all these prevention things are in place so you will have um a center limit i do have a center limit post posting that's on my teach break teachers page and i will have that hung up at their eye level that they can see and they all know only six people are allowed in the science area only six people allowed in the library area only two people allowed in the writing area so things like that so make sure it is bright and they can see it it is also a good way to teach them about number recognition so double I won't say double whammy, but double 
Winnie. <laughs> Question 9. When children paint, besides developing their small motor skills, which is known as fine motor skills, they are also developing their A. Large motor skills, B. Sense of sight, C. Sequencing skills, D. Transitioning skills. B, sense of sight. So children need opportunities to develop their senses. Painting can help them develop their sense of sight by seeing bright colors, the differences in colors, and how how the colors look when they are mixed together, okay? So when they're painting, they're like, oh, this is, this is blue. Okay, hmm. I see red. Let me mix blue and red. They'll dip their brush blue and red. Then they put it together and it's a total, totally different color of what they picked out. Usually, if they're mixing it up or they're twirling their brush, they will see like, hmm, this is now purple. So blue and red makes purple. So yeah, so you know that I look, Miss So and So, I made purple. So that also gives them a sense of sight. Um, yeah, so I just like the way their eyes light up when they see that it's just so magical. So yeah, so that right there is also a sensory um uh, thing. So sensory goes beyond of what things feel it can what they look like oh this looks soft but it's actually hard unlike cotton balls it looks soft but is it actually soft so things like that it is soft but it's kind of has like a little rough feel i had some students that even said that or it's a little squishy things like that so sense of sight is pretty much sensory um painting can be related to sensory in art so everything in early childhood education is pretty much intertwined into one Question 10. The NEYC provides professional development as the initial preparation, such as pre-service, and the A program expansion, such as marketing, B certification, such as this test, C learning experiences, such as in service, D applications, such as for this test, and as in your future programs. Now, sometimes the test will, in a, like any other type of test, they will throw something that is completely out of the norm. And it's like, huh? <laughs> like, excuse me? When was this covered? It's trying to test you, okay? So don't be alarmed. All right, so the answer to this question is C, learning experiences such as in service. Um, so the NAEC believes that the idea that learning never stops, um, learning about child development by observation, further education, advocacy, and other avenues are ways to develop it professionally and personally. All these endeavors will better you as an educator. And I can 100,000% quadruple infinity and beyond can testify to that um yes you can get all of these certifications all the degrees in early childhood education but you need to have that life experience actually working inside of the classroom with the children and variety of children not just the same ones that you grew up with you want to experience other type of personalities and things like that so Learning as a teacher never stops. Learning as a student never stops. They love to learn. Um, when they see that you like to learn, they will love and begin to em em invoke that passion for learning as well. So I agree with this statement and we're just going to leave that off with that. Um, so never stop learning. Um, there's so many different ways to teach a child about this. So many activities, how to improve them with every type of avenue in early childhood education all right so this is the end of this webinar um if you guys need anything go ahead and contact us for early childhood resources from templates um lesson activities lesson plans um, courses, webinars, and digital templates. So visit my link tree at www.linktree slash Princess Educator. It will give you guys all of the recent updates of the videos that I have created for your classroom, for you, uh, study guys, everything that's on there. It's a lot of stuff on there, you guys. Um, 
You can also visit me on t- TPT, which is known as Teachers Pay Teachers slash Princess Educator. And also visit my website at princesseducator.com for teacher tees, goodies, and digital templates. But majority of my templates are on my Teachers Pay Teachers. This one, a lot of them are on there. So I recommend you to go to my Teachers Pay Teachers page and go ahead and get some of that. Um, I also sell cute little teachers um, tees, such as the one on the bottom, to educate, to be exasperated, um, educator vibes, because I love rock tees, but why not? We don't have any for educators, so I, re- I created the educator vibes one, and we also have the educator hoodie. I love that design. That's one of my top sellers, and I have so many different colors. It's about 20 different colors every color you could think of i have it so yeah so i also have my social media links down there it's also in the link tree as well as my instagram and facebook and i also have these cda portfolio courses in other products that can help you develop your cda portfolio so thank you guys for tuning in for this webinar and i'll see you guys in my next one make sure you follow me on my social media and also subscribe subscribe to my youtube channel all right bye guys